Air war. In eight years, 15 million bombs are dropped on Vietnam. The targets are military, but as the air war escalates, it tests civilian resolve. Air war against the North is America's main strategy for stopping the war in the South. America's overwhelming air power is at first used sparingly against North Vietnam. It begins in 1965. The policy is called limited bombing. Staggered airstrikes to gauge communist response. Selecting the targets has taken an entire year of planning under President Johnson's guidance. A senior planner is Walt Roscoe. He briefs the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, William Fulbright. Uh, Mr. Roscoe. I remember had a theory, they call it surgical bombing. I heard him elaborate on this on various occasions. That is, you would give the North and East notice that we will bomb plant A tomorrow and take it out. Now, we don't want to hurt you. We don't want to kill any civilians. Everybody get away. We, this is what we're going to do. Uh, now, all you have to do is just have, go, to, go to a peace conference. Let's settle this matter. If you don't... After B and plant A, then plant B and plant B, we just give them notice. And he says, surely at some point, you know, they, they would quit because they see we'd utterly destroy the country. The theory relies on America's new catalog of high technology weapons. The F-105 Thunder Chief, the principal fighter plane. Its speed, 1,300 miles per hour. Three million missions are flown in history's longest, costliest air war. Navy carriers enable close-range missions. An around-the-clock all-weather bomber, the A-6 Intruder. It carries 30 500-pound bombs. The Intruder is designed to fly at slow speed for maximum accuracy. The supersonic F-4 Phantom. It is used to protect the bombers, patrolling ahead, striking at anti-aircraft positions. Over 40 types of attack planes are constantly over Vietnam. The B-52, the eight-engine bomber, is half as long as a football field. It flies at 30,000 feet, carrying 27 tons of bombs. An Air Force training officer explains the B-52's role in Vietnam. The use that we're making of the B-52 out here is as another tactical support weapon on the immediate battlefield. Uh, and in that capacity, I think it's been extremely effective. We find that the, the greatest effectiveness of the B-52 is this big payload. This is a very fine thing to be able to put on a target that has some impact upon your operation when you're a tactical commander. Uh, also, we like the fact that uh, it can be delivered around the clock, uh, regardless of weather, with the same general accuracy in all conditions. Uh, it can be delivered with a great deal of what we call shock effect upon the enemy, because there's really no signal that the attack is coming. Use of the air arsenal is personally supervised by President Johnson. There's a special weekly luncheon at the White House at which targets and weapons are approved. Secretary of State Dean Rusk. At those Tuesday luncheon sessions where we considered bombing targets in the North, there were times when we would require our flyers to go in through the more heavily populated areas to deliver their bombs on military targets, rather than easier targets because 
of the difference in the possible threat to civilian neighborhoods and civilian populations. The policymakers also rely on the air war to reduce American casualties in South Vietnam. The original bombing scenario calls for a communist peace overture within six months. But the communist response is to step up the war in the South. The U.S. in turn extends the area of bombing. Targets are in six main categories. One, power facilities. Two, war support facilities. Three, transportation lines. Bridges are the most important transportation targets. Four, military complexes. Five, fuel storage areas. Six, air defense installations. We hear an awful lot about surface-to-air missiles. They're called SAMs or referred to as SA-2s. This is a picture of an SA-2 site situated in the immediate Hanoi area. A close-up of this particular target would look something like this. Very clearly, you can observe the presence of SA-2 missiles. And in this area, we find the radar van, which controls the firing of the missiles, and also tracks the aircraft along with providing guidance to the SA-2 missiles. The airstrikes fail to stop the war. Half a million American troops are sent to South Vietnam. In the ground war, rapid air support is heavily used. A sizable attack is reported. A prop engine Cessna acts as scout for the jets. It locates communist troop positions and relays these to the nearest air base. Air support reaches most combat areas within minutes. The spotter plane guides the fighter bombers to their target. It becomes automated air war against jungle infiltrators, bombing by coordinates, radar-guided rockets. Napalm, which scorches a hundred-foot radius in a single burst. Satellites scan the remote jungle trails. Computer technicians in Thailand and Guam identify targets for remote control bombing. Despite the technology, communist infiltration into South Vietnam steadily increases. In North Vietnam, special labor battalions repair the bomb damage. Hanoi claims just 20 supply trucks a day reaching the South will sustain the war. 1967, in Hanoi and Haiphong, 200 missile sites and 6,000 anti-aircraft guns make the cities almost immune to low-flying aircraft. The surface-to-air missiles are Soviet SA-2s called SAMs. Mounted on trailers, the SAMs are kept moving to avoid detection. North Vietnam also gets Soviet MiG-17 jet fighters and later, the superior MiG-21s. Some MiG-21 units operate from safe bases inside China. The MiG-21s account for 90 downed American planes, but in aerial combat over North Vietnam, the U.S. claims a kill ratio of two to one. The main American aerial combat weapon is the Sidewinder missile. Moving at two and a half times the speed of sound, it can hit a target up to six miles away. It tracks an enemy plane by seeking heat from the exhaust. The Sidewinder is considered the most cost-effective missile in history. 
As the air war comes closer, Hanoi evacuates. All children and non-essential civilians are sent to the countryside, where almost everyone has relatives. Concrete potholes on every street provide a simple, inexpensive defense. With just a minute's warning, the streets empty as people scatter to these individual air raid shelters. The countryside adopts an even more unconventional defense. The southern infiltration routes are the most heavily bombed and the most vital to keep open. So entire villages go deep underground. Children are born and raised in tunnels. As the years pass, some tunnel communities extend for dozens of miles. While North Vietnam demands total commitment, America practices restraint, says Secretary of State Dean Rusk. We did not want to um, expand the war into a war of total destruction. What we were trying to do was to keep the North Vietnamese from overrunning South Vietnam. Um, and uh, hopefully we were trying to bring about the kind of settlement that we achieved in Korea, that we achieved in, with the Berlin blockade, that we achieved with the Greek guerrillas, uh, without that uh, massive all-out uh, course of destruction. And there was some point in, uh, in effect, leaving Ho Chi Minh there as a person with whom we might make peace, or at least make an armistice. So we didn't, re we didn't really go after the, uh, the city of Hanoi and the structure of the government of North Vietnam. Some American bombs are aimed at military targets in the populated suburbs of Hanoi. These communist films show civilian destruction. Most towns south of Hanoi are completely leveled in the period 1965-68. According to an official U.S. estimate, 52,000 civilians are killed. The North never discloses its casualties. Its 20 million people withstand 800,000 tons of bombs. The civilian population is mobilized in teams of thousands. Dikes, bridges, roads are rebuilt with little more than muscle. An air war designed to succeed within six months has already lasted six years. A U.S. Air Force film depicts a briefing of B-52 pilots. Open your bomb doors 30 seconds prior to release on your primary target X-ray 26. After your release, break right to point Foxtrot and proceed to the alternate IP. For release on the alternate target, open your bomb doors 30 seconds prior to release on X-ray 30. Would you rise, please? Chaplain Clarahan. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, bless these crews. Give to them the same peace and security that these men try to bring to the world today. Amen. The B-52 Stratofortress, originally built to deliver the atomic bomb, shapes the conduct of the Vietnam War. Its enormous cargo capacity is adapted to carry up to 100 bombs. Its main purpose is to destroy communist base areas. Okay, radios. You're on pilot. On copilot. Warning and indicator lights. Sixteen point zero seconds. Ready, ready. Now. Ready. Lay up on our stick now. The B-52 flies six miles high, unseen, unheard. It depends on correct intelligence to locate a target. Otherwise, it is bombing blind. Even psychologically, air war is waged at a distance. The air crews are trained to be emotionally detached. One reason 
the complex electronics demand all their attention. Also, the destructive force they control and unleash could emotionally overload them. I got the time going. Eight decimal five is what we want. Stand by to release. Ready, ready, now. Bombs away. Pack time. Ready, ready, now. A B-52 carries about 80 bombs. Each cuts like a scythe for a quarter of a mile. In Vietnam, the B-52s are only in danger when there are missile defenses. For the low-flying fighter bomber pilots, it is very different. More than half of those shot down are killed in the crashes. They must control fear. Although at times, uh, you're, you're pretty scared when you have to roll in on something up there, especially when you look down and you see nothing but a black cloud or a white cloud down below you. It's, uh, it's about as, as scary a mission as I've ever been on. Uh, I think it tries you to just about the maximum on uh, the missions. If you can get between uh, a ridge between you and that radar site, they can't guide a missile at you. It's just when you get down in the delta in the flatlands, that 30 mile ring around uh, the city of Hanoi is, is a bear. I kind of call it the dry throat mission myself. Usually I come out bound from the target and I'm just kind of sucking that water bottle dry, dry throat. <laughs> Big thing that gets to us some nights. We're the only airplane going up, going up into the north. And when you think we're the only Americans over North Vietnam, it kind of makes you wonder just a little bit, you know. What am I doing here? American aircraft losses over the north increase each year. Anti-aircraft militia units, often women, become more effective. Hanoi claims 4,800 American planes downed over the north. The U.S. estimates 1,000. The relatively high rescue rate boosts pilot morale. About one in five shot down just inside the north are saved by special helicopter teams. Right, Go get him. Okay, just stand by, babe. We'll come in to get you. Stand by. You're on the fence, right? are going to send him down. Two Sikorskis constantly patrol the border. A V-shaped winch cuts through the jungle foliage, then serves as a rescue platform. Fighter planes are called in to give protective fire. A second helicopter scouts for danger, ready for close-in fighting. The rescue helicopters become known as the Jolly Green Giants. More than 200 pilots are rescued from inside North Vietnam. Hold your hover, bear. Hold your hover. Looking good. Hold your hover. Hold your hover. The bear is coming up. It's about 10 foot off the ground. Hold your hover. Hold your hover. You're close to a tree. Hold your hover. It's right about 10 foot below the aircraft. 10 foot below the aircraft. Hold your hover, bear. Hold your hover. Hold your hover. Hold your hover. Hold your hover. Well, Jarvis, the door. Survivor, secure. Let's get the hell out of here. Okay, talk to me. We're coming out. Come on, coming out. Let's go. Okay, ready in. Ready in. Down that valley and get low. Get low. We love to follow that valley, Charlie. U.S. aircraft losses in both South and North Vietnam are put at 3,720. The dollar cost, 5 billion. And helicopter losses number 5,000. More than 8,000 American airmen are killed. About 800 of them in the north. Some personal possessions, such as helmets and identity tags, are collected for Hanoi's War Museum. Each pilot during the air war carries a message in several Asian languages saying, I am an American. I need your assistance. My government will repay you. More than 600 pilots are captured in the north. 
Most of the captives spend four or five years in prison, but for some, it lasts eight years. By 1968, the overall cost is too great for the man who oversees the air war. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara has lost confidence in America's ability to win the war. He is publicly viewed as a dispassionate architect of Vietnam's technological war, but privately, he agonizes. Once a proponent of the bombing, he now strongly advocates peace. President Johnson believes his defense secretary is cracking up. McNamara is eased out to head the World Bank. For many long and quite demanding years, Bob McNamara has guided the defense establishment. He has helped to give America the most efficient military strength in its history. And now he's going to try, try to build the kind of world that alone can justify that strength. And now, in public, McNamara's torment shows. Mr. President, <coughs> I cannot <coughs> find words to uh, express what lies in my heart today. <coughs> and I think I'd better respond on another occasion. The war spurs ever more sophisticated technology, including laser-guided bombs that automatically home in on the target. A laser kit on the warhead picks up the reflection from the target. Movable tail fins automatically steer the bomb. A weapons expert, General William Depew. As you undoubtedly uh, remember the oft-repeated story of the famous Tanwa Bridge. Uh, I don't know how many sorties and how many tons of bombs were dropped in an attempt to break, uh, to, to drop that span, uh, but a laser-guided uh, bomb did it apparently on the first try. War always uh, engenders a great expenditure of money on high technology, and the precision-guided munitions, although they saw uh, their early use during the Vietnam War, their real significance remains for the future. The B-52 becomes the test of air war technology in Vietnam. With a crew of six, the B-52 flies at 30 to 40,000 feet, close to the speed of sound. Its 100 bombs fall without warning in what is called whispering death. Its proponents regard the B-52 bomber as the single most effective weapon in the Vietnam Air War. Its critics liken it to an unwieldy axe more likely to splinter trees than communist units. To be most effective, the B-52s must catch a North Vietnamese unit in the open. Then it is estimated one in three will be killed within the radius of the bomb blast. But in the jungle war, communist units are seldom without cover. A newspaper study indicates that in jungle areas, it takes three B-52s using 80 tons of bombs to kill one infiltrator. The cost is about $140,000. So the B-52 is viewed by its critics as a costly and inefficient method of fighting. As one critic put it, like using a sledgehammer to kill flies. And as the war goes on, the only solution is to deploy more and more B-52s over the infiltration trails. The B-52's effectiveness is also reduced by security problems. At times, the targets have to be approved by local officials, so communist agents may learn of impending raids. The Air Force must advise international airlines to keep away from bombing routes. Again, this may alert communist ground forces. Even though the bombing has stepped up, the infiltration of troops and supplies continues. Strategically, the air war fails. <laughs> 